is the future of America. Regardless of what we do here in the present, a future will come to be. It is my hope that this future is a pleasant one. There are, indeed, a number of possibilities I'd be more or less happy with, though it is of importance what specific future I do actively hope for, what future I strive to see. In the context of America, I wish to see an America free from the governance of the United States. In no uncertain terms, I wish to see the end of the United States of America. I can sit here all day and talk to you about the crimes of this nation-state. I can talk about its foundations through slavery and genocide. I can talk about white supremacy and how the United States is its stately manifestation. I can talk about imperialism and wars abroad, and just the same, I can talk about oppression and violence domestically. Just as I finished writing the script for this video, the death toll from an entirely preventable pandemic had surpassed 225,000. That is the size of a typical American city, a city such as Tallahassee, Rochester, Salt Lake City, Richmond, or Baton Rouge. Gone from the face of the earth. Do I really have to detail the absolute contempt for its citizenry that the United States has when it allows so many to die so needlessly? This is only the most recent example of the indignities Americans have suffered under U.S. governance. Poverty, police brutality, and ecological destruction are the very lifeblood of this nation-state. With a constitution that makes reform an astronomical improbability, and a political establishment that turns that improbability into an absolute impossibility, it should be easy to see that America has no future if the United States is to continue existing as a political entity. Indeed, the people of the entire world have no future. The U.S. military, by itself, is the world's largest polluter and contributor to climate change. There is nothing salvageable about the United States. Any impulse that you have, on the contrary, is a leftover from an entire upbringing that taught you nothing other than that the United States was the greatest nation on Earth. You learned that in school as a child and from mass media as an adult. All the while, you had to reconcile what those sources taught you with your lived reality. What have your lived experiences taught you? What have you actually seen throughout your life? Rotting infrastructure? Ceaseless cycles of economic depression? Endless wars and violence? Poverty or the threat thereof? And now rampant disease? You know that the United States isn't the greatest nation on Earth, but a part of you still believes it is, largely because propaganda works. You are not immune. Neither am I. It's not really your fault. A massive empire had set its eyes on you from the moment you were born. They made you pledge your loyalty to their flag every day, before you even had a concept of what loyalty even was. You had no reasonable expectation for a defense. Although, as the depravities of the United States become more and more apparent, and you've grown into the full-thinking person that you are, the idea that you would continue to defend this nation, and seek to uphold it in perpetuity, strikes me as suicidal when it is so clearly understood that the United States seeks your subjugation, and ultimately your destruction, and beyond the matters of the individual, seeks much the same fate for the world in its entirety. I understand that I'm not going to convince everyone right here and right now, if anything, the person this intro was made for has stopped watching, called the cops, or is only watching in anger for hopes of being able to ridicule me. But that's fine. Whatever will be done, will be done. The reality will not be changed simply because it is unpleasant. Regardless of what we do here in the present, a future will come to be. I hope it's a pleasant future, but I know it does not have to be. Our choice for the future is the same choice it's always been. Our choice is socialism or extinction. The capitalist economic system is what brought us to our current predicament. 
There is no solution to our problems from the system that caused our problems. We should destroy completely the United States, and where there once stood an antagonistic force, we should seek to establish autonomous communities united through free association in the spirit of democratic confederalism. I believe that to be the most viable and preferable future we could work towards, and maybe, just maybe, find ourselves in. I believe terms like autonomous communities and free association are easy to understand as they are. Communities are autonomous. They are free to do whatever it is they want or need to do. There is no outside force above the community imposing its will on the community. In our present day, the economy of communities are determined by an ultra-wealthy ruling class who use state power to enforce private property. But without private property, state power, or class hierarchy, communities for themselves would be able to take direct control of their own economies and with it be able to produce whatever it is they want or whatever it is they need. Through this economy of free association, communities would naturally unite with one another. Not every community would be able to survive completely independently, and so they would come together and cooperate freely and mutually. And where this cooperation would be not viable, necessary, or otherwise desirable, it would cease. The term democratic confederalism, however, does not immediately conjure up a notion of whatever it is. It's democratic, and it's confederal, sure, but what does that actually mean in terms of day-to-day -day realities? Democratic confederalism is a democracy without a state. It is flexible, multicultural, anti-monopoly, and consensus-oriented. It is a decentralized, participatory democracy that exists of society and so exists for society. And again, that is just a string of nice-sounding words. You'd be right for asking, as I have, okay, but what is it really? How are things done in it? How are things organized? And, of course, the eternal question, what? Huh? Hmm? Indeed, I think that goes to show how entrenched the governance of nation-states are in our mind, that it is difficult to understand what an order without one would be. However, such orders have existed previously, and they can again. It is not a fantasy, and it is not just a string of nice words. And for some people in this world, the people of northeastern Syria, it is their reality. Still, I found it difficult to understand without a point of reference. So now, I hope I can describe democratic confederalism in terms of practical, real-world problem-solving. You might live with people, a family or roommates. You all may notice it getting colder lately as the winter sets in. You all agreed to turn the heat on. Congratulations, you've democratically reached a consensus on a matter that concerned you all. Now, you might live in an apartment. The maintenance of that apartment is the collective interest of everyone who lives in that building. So, say the plumbing is bad. You would come together and decide how that problem should be fixed. Maybe, with the collective knowledge of the apartment's denizens, you can fix it yourselves, or maybe you lack that and must seek outside help. Whichever case may be, you'll figure that out together. Much better than waiting on the whims of a landlord, notorious for their neglect. Give me rent. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! Now consider that you might live in a neighborhood. You and your neighbors living in that neighborhood will know better than anyone what problems face that neighborhood. And to solve those problems will require you and your neighbors to come together, just as you've done in the previous examples, and figure out what is to be done and how to do it. At this point, it may be beneficial to do so in a more formalized way through organized and purposeful meetings. The formation of these structures is to be decided on by that neighborhood as well, but they are to be democratic, with each member having an equal say. Furthermore, the decision of the neighborhood needs to be carried out by the people of the neighborhood. When people agree to do things, they've got to do the things. 
That is what I believe participatory democracy to be. Democracy is not just forming an assembly and talking about potential solutions to problems, it is also the physical act of seeing those solutions through. Let's say the roads in your neighborhood are deteriorating, as is all too common across America. Your neighborhood may hold a meeting where you will discuss how to fix the roads. There, you and your neighbors will collectively figure out how to get the materials you need and how to organize the labor force. The labor force being organized just so happens to consist of the exact same people who are in that meeting. You'll notice how this process puts the power directly in the hands of the people, whereas currently, many communities across this country just have to deal with bad roads because their state or city governments are too slow, unwilling, or unable to act. The current order we live under leaves people helpless to solve their own problems, whereas the order I'm proposing gives people not only an active voice in solving their problems, but an active role as well. This pattern more or less repeats with each larger version of a political group, from the neighborhood community to the city, and from the city to the region, and from the region to the globe. Citywide problems can only be solved by the people of the city, regional problems by the people of the region, and the types of problems that affect everyone living on the globe can only realistically be solved through the collective action of everyone who lives on the globe. At first glance, this may not seem all that dissimilar from how the United States of America is supposed to function, the United States being a federation of states, where the federal government handles federal problems, state governments handle state problems, counties handle county problems, cities handle city problems, and individuals handle individual problems. However, the system of the United States is hierarchical with each level of administration only being as autonomous as the level of administration above them allows them to be. The federal government is above the state government, the state government is above the county, the county is above the city, and the city is above the individual person. States can only act where the federal government does not intervene, and in this system, even the individual person is only as free and autonomous as the city, county, state, and federal government allows them to be. The current form of democracy we have is representative, even at the small-scale neighborhood and city levels. You are never encouraged to think of the problems that you face as a community, but rather you are encouraged to vote for the smoothest talking politician in hopes that they'll take care of everything for you. And well, that hasn't really worked out now, has it? Democracy isn't voting on one corruptible, valuable person who will impose their vision on a community. Democracy is when a community works together toward a shared vision. The democracy of the United States is not a real democracy, but democratic confederalism is. That is what it is meant when it is said that democratic confederalism is anti-monopolistic. It does not monopolize power. The power to solve problems autonomously is shared by all political groups. This non-hierarchical structure and its decentralized nature is what allows it to be so flexible to so many different modes of administration or government traditions, as well as allow it to be multicultural, as it allows for many different cultures to express themselves and manifest into their own political groups. In the context of America, those qualities are what I believe makes democratic confederalism ideal. I think democratic confederalism is the method that would see us to the realization of autonomous communities united through free association, and I think it speaks to the conditions of this region in many ways. The most important of these conditions I will briefly discuss are indigenous sovereignty, black nationalism, white nationalism, and capitalism. America is a product of settler colonialism. The United States of America is a settler colonial nation-state serving the interests of a capitalist ruling class. To establish this required the United States of America to enact campaigns of genocide, forced assimilation, and subjugation of indigenous nations. In spite of the best efforts of the United States, these nations still exist and largely seek to maintain the sovereignty they have fought hard to protect. Democratic confederalism would absolutely preserve the sovereignty of these nations. 
Democratic confederalism recognizes the right of people to express their cultural, ethnic, and national identities with the help of political organizations. And so, the many different nations on this North American continent would find their national sovereignty maintained. In the context of America, democratic confederalism is decolonial. The second general condition of America is the violence and oppression faced by black people. Now, I don't really know a whole lot about black nationalism, but I can say that black communities would be free in much the same way as native communities would be. I, at this time, don't see a reason why the organization of New Africa wouldn't be able to fit into this framework. The conditions of black and indigenous peoples are the consequences of white supremacy, of white nationalism. The destruction of the United States as a nation state would do a lot of work in eliminating the ability of white nationalists and of white supremacist policy to do harm. Beyond that, the American national identity is itself a product of white nationalism. There is no such thing as a white nation other than the imaginary one that the United States pursues. Without the United States, the vague conception of American begins to crumble and with it white nationalism. More specifically, democratic confederalism encourages more connection to one's immediate community and grounds people in the natural conditions that create those communities. This is in opposition to the nationalism of the United States that alienates people from their natural communities in the service of the imagined American community. A more concrete example is that right now a white person might consider themselves to be an American because they were born a citizen to the United States. But without the United States, they may find that their national identity was never American at all, but something more local and grounded in reality. Maybe they're an Appalachian, an Alleghenian, a Cascadian, or whatever new national identities might arise in the absence of the artificial America. Whatever the case may be, there would be no medium through which white nationalism could be established or through which white supremacy could continue. Without the enforcement of whiteness, the idea of a white person ceases to be a political distinction. However, this would take a concentrated effort, as the current racial segregation of America means that there are all white communities. Going into democratic confederalism, the legacy of this segregation would be very apparent, and communities based around reactionary whiteness could potentially form. Though, through the economics of free association, these communities would find themselves isolated, and in the environment of multiculturalism that democratic confederalism establishes, the ideology that maintains these communities could not survive. A fire cannot burn without oxygen. This may seem unsatisfactory and passive in the context of the current threat that white nationalists pose, but that current context is created by our current conditions. They pose such a threat because they are able to hold on to so much power through state institutions. Eliminating those institutions eliminates their power and eventually eliminates them. Maybe democratic confederalism doesn't seem all that great in this regard because it doesn't immediately fix racism. But consider that racism is encouraged and propagated by the current order we live under. I'd urge you to consider which order you'd prefer. The current order that has white nationalists in position of power and authority over you, or an order where white nationalists have no power or authority over anyone. An order that actively promotes white supremacy, or an order that dismantles supremacy itself. Finally, we've come to the condition of capitalism. While democratic confederalism doesn't necessarily abolish private property, it does put the entirety of political force into the hands of a decentralized community that can very easily counteract the machinations of a would-be capitalist. Similarly to white supremacy, the ideology that maintains capitalism cannot survive in an environment of participatory democracy. Realistically, a business could only be established with the consent of the community, and under those conditions, only businesses that serve the community on the community's terms could survive. Through that, I could see trade unions or cooperatives forming the political organization of the economy broadly, 
with these trade unions or cooperatives acting as yet another political group in the context of other political groups, just as the neighborhood community democratically decides how to manage the community, a workplace would democratically decide how to manage the workplace. Capitalism needs a nation-state in order to function. Capitalism cannot survive in a non-state democracy, so communism can be established through democratic confederalism. Of course, that's all fine and dandy, but until it happens, it unfortunately is just a bunch of nice words. The question is, how can this future come to be? This future can only be built from the ground up. This future comes to be when people establish it through forming these political groups and associations. I think the biggest obstacle to democratic confederalism in America is the lack of concrete communities here. That, and of course, extremist individualism. Americans move very frequently, with almost a quarter of the entire population having moved at some point within the last five years. Americans don't settle down or build roots, and instead go wherever work might take them. In this environment, true community is difficult to form, and where it does exist, it is difficult to incorporate oneself in two. This transitory nature goes on to reinforce that individualist culture. It is difficult to consider joining a community action when you believe your presence in that community is only temporary. It is hard to see how a community's problems affect you, or what those problems even are, when you've only just arrived and have every expectation that you will leave at any moment. If we are to pursue democratic confederalism in America, then we have to start with developing communities in the first place. And for communities that already exist, developing methods for incorporating new members or for community retention. I think the participatory democracy model of decision-making is perfect for this, as it encourages active participation, and with active participation comes personal investment. Beyond that, I believe mutual aid networks to be the most promising vehicle through which this future could come to be. Mutual aid networks, serving their community, have the added effect of growing and building their community. Through that growth, they can come to take on more and more ambitious projects until they eventually develop the mechanisms through which they can replace their local governments as the legitimate mode of administration in a community. But how does the United States end? This future hinges on the destruction of the American Empire, and no, I can't really predict what will happen in the future any more than you can. What I can say, though, is that I do not believe any existing political institution will make even the slightest dent in averting the climate crisis. So the world, and America with it, will be plunged into ever-increasing disaster. As can be seen in recent years, the United States is unstable. It will not be able to maintain control of a global empire while suffering from fire after fire, hurricane after hurricane, and pandemic after pandemic. With the failure to respond increasing the already fiery unrest, the United States will be sent into a tailspin from which it cannot recover. The United States will be forced to recede internationally and eventually continue receding its effective control of its own territory, meaning that when the federal government recedes in power and legitimacy, the mutual aid networks and strong communities that we form today will be able to step up and fill the void. And if the United States attempts to re-establish itself in a territory that it lost, those communities will be able to defend themselves and their autonomy. The level of active participation in the demise of the United States will vary from place to place. I do not believe the United States will fall completely on its own, and active and purposeful resistance will be required, though I think the nature of that resistance will likely be sporadic and unable to organize on a national scale due to the continued existence of the CIA and COINTELPRO through this process. I don't imagine a Great Red Army or a front line. Rather, the United States will collapse under its own weight and revolutionary forces will rise up to lay the final blows and to protect the people from reactionary forces like dominionist militias or something. 
the fall of the United States may look something similar to the Syrian Civil War, making democratic confederalism all the more relevant to the American situation. As far as what specific administrative structures form through democratic confederalism, everything being so decentralized and up to many different communities and political groups to organize themselves, I can't reliably say. What I do know is that where democratic confederalism actually exists, in northeast Syria, the people there have absolutely formed those structures and those political organizations. Though, whatever they have made may not necessarily be an ideal organization for us here in America. We can't just copy and paste the politics of people on the other side of the planet and expect it to work for us in the same way that it works for them. Rather, what we make here will be entirely dependent on the situation the various communities and nations of America find themselves in, and so specific administrative structures will be varied. As of 5.23 p.m. on Wednesday, the 28th of October, 2020, that is roughly what I believe. Now, there are many gaps in my understanding, as there probably are in yours. Understand that this video represents the humble opinion of a lone individual with a specific perspective formed through the conditions of my life and the information I have thus far been able to consume. I admit these thoughts need more work and substance. In an essay about the future of America, I only had a small paragraph about black nationalism and half that paragraph was an apology for not knowing more. You don't need me to tell you that these politics are incomplete. I endeavor to continue learning as much as I endeavor to continue participating in mutual aid efforts. Though I think that very incompleteness speaks for the value democratic confederalism could have, you can't rely on individuals to solve collective problems. Only that collective which faces the problem understands the problem and knows how to solve it. Through true democracy, we do not rely on the intelligence and wisdom of a single individual or small oligarchy, but rather we rely on the collective intelligence and wisdom of all. Where I am lacking, someone else is not. So then, only together can we create a pleasant future. If you'd like to learn more, here are some handy videos. Links are in the description. Constructing the Revolution by Anarch is a wonderful video talking about pre-configuration essentially what needs to be organized in order to create a successful revolution. If you are disappointed by my video, then Anarch definitely has a more concrete and expansive understanding of things that I'm sure you'll appreciate. If you are interested in learning the specifics of the Democratic Confederalist project as it exists in Northeast Syria, the stuff I neglected, then I suggest you watch The Communes of Rojava, a model in societal self-direction by Neighbor Democracy. It is a comprehensive documentary breaking down exactly how their governments and services work. If you're wondering what you can do, yes you, I suggest getting involved in or starting mutual aid in your area. In that respect, I recommend listening to Mutual Aid 101, an interview with Red Army Duck by A World to Win, an insightful interview discussing the basics of mutual aid, how to get involved, and why it's so important. I would like to thank my patrons, Aracobia, Jake, Josh Thomas, Candle Carey, and Paz. Before you go, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and share. I'd appreciate it greatly. Every action helps. Above all, though, please have a wonderful day.